الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد. Today, inshallah, is the 16th of Rajab, 1436. We begin our second class as it relates to the fiqh of salat, dealing with some of the akhta, or the mistakes that people make concerning the prayer. And before getting into the prayer itself, the actual essence of the prayer and the mechanics of the prayer, there are certain issues that need to be considered that are considered to be from the muqaddimat, things before the prayer. And as we mentioned last time, there are many things connected to wudu and other than that. So the last lesson, we dealt with some of the mistakes that people make as it relates to the clothes they wear. And we mentioned a few of the more important and glaring and popular issues. Today, inshallah, we're going to deal with another really critical issue that we have to consider, and that are that is the mistakes that people make in the places that they pray, in the actual place that the prayer is going to be conducted. There are many mistakes in this regard where people are mutahawinun, they are negligent and not paying attention. And we see the emphasis that the Quran and the Sunnah and the companions, may Allah be a peace be may Allah be pleased with all of them, they paid a lot of attention to these issues. One of them is carried over a little bit from last week's talk, and that is the impermissibility and the dislike of praying in a place where there are pictures or anything that will cause an individual to lose his concentration, whether it's from a picture or it's not from a picture. The Nabi Wasallam was praying, and he had some clothes on that had some images on it that distracted him. So after the prayer, he told the companions, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'een idhabu bihadhi al-khamisa ila Abi Jahm ibn Abi Hudayfa fa'innaha qad alhatni an anifan fi salati. Take this piece of cloth. And he took his clothes off. He said, take this to my companion, Abu Jahm. Ibn Abi Hudayfa, because this clothes, these clothes that I was wearing, they made me and it caused me to be, to lose my concentration during the prayer. The great scholar of Islam, Al Imam al Sun'ani, al Sun'ani wrote the book of Fiqh, Subl al Salam, one of those books that the student of knowledge eventually has to get to when he's trying to be a serious student of knowledge because the book is built upon. The fiqh of the hadith, as opposed to what you find in the madhabs, do this, do that, do this, do this. This is a book where he brought a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and he extracted from those a hadith why you do this and why you do that. Anyway, he was one of the great scholars of Al Yemen, tremendous muhaddith and a faqih. Concerning that hadith, he said that this hadith, it shows, it indicates a proof that. It is dislike for a person to pray in an area where he's going to be distracted by a carpet that has colors or images or pictures are hanging around him. So that's the first issue that we have. Another proof of this to show that it's serious and the Prophet and his companions took it seriously, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and for the person who's trying to do his salat in the best way is when he conquered Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And we're going to do a talk inshallah On the last Saturday of this month May be idhnillah about the conquest of Mecca In the conquest of Mecca When the Prophet went to the Kaaba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He refused to go inside of the Kaaba Although he now came back and he had power He ordered Umar Radiallahu anhu Go inside the Kaaba And wipe the pictures that have been Drawn by Quraysh Wipe them off of the wall. After Umar did that, the Nabi went inside of the Kaaba, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he prayed two rakat inside of the Kaaba, sallallahu wasallam alayhi. Number three, what shows why we shouldn't pray with things that are around us is what the companions were upon, and this is really extremely important for many of us. And that is what was collected by Imam Ibn Abi Shaib in his book, Kitab al-Musannaf, that 
it was mentioned كَانَ الصَّحَابَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ لَا يُسَلُّونَ فِي الْكَنَائِسِ إِذَا كَانَتْ فِيهَا سُورْ The companions of the Prophet ﷺ when they traveled throughout the world to spread Islam especially in Asham they would not pray in the churches if the churches had pictures in them if the churches had images in them Umar radiallahu anhu doing his khilafah when he was the leader of the Muslims the place Jerusalem Beit al-Maqdis it was conquered by the Muslims Umar may Allah be pleased with him went personally to take the keys because it's an important place it's a place where a Muslim can go and he can travel to pray in that masjid 250 prayers if you pray in there one salat plus he was happy that he was the khalif and the ruler of the Muslims so this was a tremendous fadl of Allah upon him. When he went to accept the key, he was invited to come inside of the church. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, told the preacher, the priest to invite him. He said, Inna la natkhul kanaisakum fa inna fiha tamathil. We won't go inside of your churches because in your churches there are pictures, there are statues, and there are images. Another situation in that story, that hadith, that athar of Umar is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Another hadith that Imam al-Bukhari brought is what happened with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He would go inside of a church and he would pray inside of a church if the church didn't have pictures and it didn't have statues and it didn't have images. So this is also in Sahih al-Bukhari. All of that shows and it indicates that a person shouldn't pray in a place where there are pictures. So many of us, alhamdulillah, we don't have pictures in our homes. But maybe we have to pray at our job in a room where there's a picture. Shouldn't be done. You go to the airport and there's a place where there's picture. Shouldn't be done. The person should only do it if he's absolutely forced. He's forced to do it, then it's permissible. From this issue of going into the churches, and this is really, I want you to pay attention to this, inshallah, azawajal, because it shows a few things. Goes to show that the salaf, when it came to not praying behind innovators, or not praying in the masjid of the innovators that has its context, it shouldn't be understood that you can't pray in a masjid where their people were innovators, no matter what you can't pray there. How is it that Abdullah ibn Abbas will go inside of a church and pray in a church if the church didn't have those tamathil and those sur. And we're sure that Abdullah ibn Abbas, the reason why he went into those churches is not because he didn't find another place to pray. He was giving da'wah Allah. He was educating the people. The time for prayer came, so he prayed in the church. Because as the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ju'ilat li al-ard masjidin wa tahura. The whole earth, the whole earth, has been made a masjid for me and a purifier so you can do tayammum if you don't have water. So you can pray anywhere in the earth other than the places where the religion said don't pray here and we're going to come to that as well, inshallah. So if the companions, some of them, the ulama from of them, prayed in a church, who in his right mind is going to tell a Muslim you can't pray in that masjid because they're the people of innovation? Even if they're really from the people of innovation, and we're not talking about a masjid with a group of people who you don't like, and you just make them innovative, so no matter what, you'll never come to their masjid, as we have here, Green Lane. People say Green Lane is a masjid of innovators. A major scholar will come, and the person, his fifth, the young person, his fifth, the young boy, the young girl, 18, 19, trying to be on the sunnah, they say, no, nah, we can't go because it's the masjid of the innovators. First, it's not the masjid of the innovators. Second of all, second of all, you're understanding the issue the wrong way. So if the masjid has innovators in it and they're doing kufr, then you don't pray behind those people. But you can still go to that masjid and you can still pray in that masjid. Number two, concerning what happened with Umar, Abdullah bin Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, praying in the church. And this whole issue, it goes to show those of us who are involved in what they call... Mm, interfaith dialogue and dawah that was pretty popular a few years ago Muslims were trying to 
help the non-Muslims understand who we are. So some things used to take place that were a problem. I see in the audience some of the brothers connected to Green Lane, they're giving Dawa in the city center. They may be invited, go here, go there, a church, and other than this. When it's time for Salat, and those places have pictures in it, statues, the Salaf from the companions, radiallahu anhum, they didn't pray in those places. So if you have the ability to exit that place and to go outside or to another place, then this is what the companions used to do. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he would pray in a church that didn't have pictures, that didn't have statues. The other thing, Ikhwani, and the last thing concerning this particular issue is that some of us, we are working. Some of us, we find ourselves in situations where we have to pray and these things are going on. I want to make it clear that the Salat in those places is disliked. The scholars didn't say that the Salat in those places makes your Salat haram, batila, that you have to redo your Salat. It is something that is disliked, and as a result of that, it should be avoided. It should be avoided. Number two, Ikhwani, is the issue of the totin and makan. Praying in the same place when you come to the masjid is a mistake that people make. It is a mistake that people make. Now you have to pay attention to this because there's a distinction. And you have to understand the distinction. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa as the companion said, Nahana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you watan al rajul makan fil masjid. Kama you watan al ba'ir. He prohibited us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from praying in the same place and sticking to that same place the way a camel sticks to a place. From the nature of the camel is that if you give him a large area, like the whole size of this masjid, for an example, to graze way over there, to drink the water way over there, to visit his cousins and his relatives over there, just to wander around. When that camel wants to rest, no matter where he went in that area, he's going to come back to where he always rests. It's just something from the camels. And the Prophet Sallallahu knowing the nature of the camel, he gave this example so that the people can understand. The dog, Akramakumullah. He said anyone who gives a gift and then he takes the gift back is like the dog that vomits and he licks up his vomit. From the nature of the dog, from the fitr of the dog, if he vomits, he's going to get up, he's going to walk around that vomit a few times, smell it, and then he's going to lick it up. That's how, what they saw, that was the situation. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited us from praying in the same place all the time, with the exception of the imam. With the exception of the imam, because he's always going to be in the same place for the prayer. He's always going to be in the same place for the prayer. Now, there is an authentic incident that happened with a tabi'i and one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The tabi'i, his name was Qurra ibn Abi Yazid, Rahimahullahu Ta'ala. He said that the, the companion Salama ibn al Akwa, he was one of those individuals, may Allah be pleased with him, he was a powerful man in Jahiliyyah. He stayed outside of Islam for a long time. He was a person who the Prophet وسلم, to encourage him to come into the religion. While he was a non Muslim, he gave him a lot of camels. One of the eight people that can receive the zakat are the mu'allifatu qulubihim, those people interested in Islam. So you give them from the zakat. And that man came into Islam because the Prophet had hikmah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't say the man was a kafir. He didn't say the man was a coconut. He didn't say that the man was a taagot. He didn't say that the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he didn't behave in that type of way. The religion of al-Islam said, you can give an individual like this, a da'wah Allah, by giving him something that he likes. Because when he comes into Islam, he's going to use his power. He's going to use his resources. He's going to use his personality to help the community. As for the short-sighted individual, 16, 17, he may be 30, 35, but if something's wrong with his aql, he'll go to that individual and chop his head off. Chop his head off and say, we have to make kufr with a taghut. Anyway. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him from the money he embraced Islam. The Tabi'i, the Tabi'i, Yazid ibn, Qurra ibn Abi Yazid. He saw this companion 
always praying behind a particular column, a p- pillar in the masjid. He always saw him every day praying behind that pillar. The tabi went and said, why is it? Mali araka tataharra had al makan salat Why are you always praying in this particular place? He said, رضي الله عنه لأنني رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يتحراه في صلاته Because I saw the Prophet always praying here. صلى الله عليه وسلم So now someone knows this hadith that says this person prayed there all the time. And he said the Prophet prayed there all the time. This other hadith said, don't pray in the same place. Now, the one with Iman, is he going to come and he's going to say, you see the contradictions in the sunnah and the hadith, just give me the Quran? No, he's going to know that there is a plausible explanation. One of the great scholars of Al-Islam, his name is Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, mentioned him a lot. He was Hanafi. Used to be Shafi'i, then he became Hanafi. Rahimahullah ta'ala, he's the author of the book, Aqidat al-Tahawiyya. And in that Aqidah, especially the beginning of it, it's a small book, in the beginning of it, he started that book off by saying, this is the aqidah of the people of the sunnah. And Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Malik, and Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. And then he went on to establish the aqidah. He made some mistakes that the scholars criticized him for, mentioning certain things. But you should know, just being Hanafi doesn't make you a person who's out of the sunnah. And Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, he wrote... Two main books, aside from that book, he's known for fiqh more than anything. One of them is a book called Sharh Ma'ani Al-Athar, the meaning and the explanation of the meaning of the ahadith. Really important book. He wrote another book called Mushkil Al-Athar, the problems that are presented with certain ahadith, ahadith that seem to conflict, hadith that seem to be difficult to understand. Hadith that were abrogated, that if you were to read that hadith, you would begin to say, wow, this is, I don't understand it. The scholars didn't leave anything unturned. So what did they do about this issue? Over there, he used to see him praying there all the time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Over here, he said, don't pray in the same place. The way we understand it is the nafil prayer. If you want to make a tanaful, if you want to make a sunnah prayer, you always go back there to pray. No problem. You always go over there to pray. No problem. In your house, in your house, the sunnah from the sunnahs that have been abandoned is to have a place in your house which is called the mihrab. Not this thing right here, but a room, a walk-in closet, a corner. You pray in that place all the time. No problem. This is okay. The hadith of the prohibition doesn't include that. The hadith of prohibition is talking about praying the fard prayer all the time. So the imam, it's okay for him to pray the same place all the time. But it's not okay for the imam to pray the nafil prayer all the time in the same place. When he has to come through and break the shoulders of the people to go into the front to pray the nafil prayer. No. This hadith of prohibition, it applies to him because it's general. What he's allowed to do is to pray the fard prayer. And there are many wisdoms for that, ikhwani. From the wisdoms is, yomu qiyama. The earth is going to bear witness for people, what they did and what they didn't do. So the earth is going to mention he prayed here, he prayed there, he did this, he did that. And also, when you do something all the time, it takes on the image of becoming the religion. So I get the question, is it permissible for me to dim the lights when I'm praying? Can I light candles that have a scent to it? Can I light bukhur and incense so that I can get in the mood? That's permissible. Just don't think that's part of the salat. Don't do it all the time to the point where you begin to feel, I must do these things in order to perform the prayer. So that's the second issue of doing mistakes as it relates to the amakin, the makan. Number three is the important issue of the sutra. The sutra. Now I think, alhamdulillah, the spread, the knowledge of the spread of the sutra it has hit the vast majority of people. But some people don't know. We're not going to get into the details of the fiqh of the sutra, although that should be done at some point. But we just want to make mention. If a person prays, any place that he prays, he should take a sutra. In his house, in the car park, the parking lot, 
If he prays inside of his job, if he prays outside, in the desert, in the mountain, wherever he prays, and he should take a sutra. And that's because the Prophet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تصلي إلا إلى سترة ولا تضع أحد يمر بين يديك فإن أبى فلتقاتله فإن معه قرين Don't pray except that you pray towards a sutra in front of you and don't allow anyone to walk in front of you between your sutra and yourself and if someone tries to walk between you and your sutra then stop him forcefully and if he insists on walking between you and your sutra, then fight him, prevent him with power. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَسْتَتِرْ If any of you prays, then take a sutra. And there are many other hadith. Now if you notice about these two hadith, the first one said, لَا تُصَلِّي إِلَّا إِلَى sutra." He prohibited you, don't do it. Don't pray except that you pray towards a sutra. The second hadith, it said, If any of you prays, then he commanded, then pray with a sutra. And that's one of the powerful ways of our religion telling the importance of an issue where it establishes something and it prevents its opposite, the same issue, like la ilaha illallah. And there are other hadith, a number of other ahadith. The importance of the sutra with the companions. Hadith wala haraj. For the person who wants to think that this is a simple issue. Now no doubt, there are some scholars who are of the opinion, ulama who are of the opinion, that you don't have to take a sutra. But the one who understands the way the religion is and the legislation of the religion, he knows it's not what the scholar said that makes it right or wrong. Or how many scholars... It's what the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The scholar comes to Green Lane Masjid and he prays with Allah Sutra. We're going to say, yeah, but Sheikh so-and-so said, hey, Sheikh so-and-so is a scholar, but no one, no one, no one is infallible. And no one should be followed other than the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we appreciate, maybe that's the opinion of the Sheikh, that he takes the opinion, you don't have to have a sutra. And we have husn al There's a hadith that said when the Prophet performed Hajj, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was at Arafah. And he made salah ila ghayri jidarin. He prayed and there was no wall in front of him. That is an authentic hadith. Some people took that hadith to show you don't have to have a sutra. But there are other hadith that explain that situation. Just because a person doesn't have a wall in front of him doesn't mean he didn't have a sutra. A brother was praying today, his sunnah after Salat al-Isha, he had his bag that he has all of that money. He's carrying 10,000 pounds with him right now. He had a bag with all of his money in it. It was the sutra in front of him. He didn't pray in front of a wall. Plus, the Prophet wasallam used to put a spear in the ground. He would pray towards the spear. He would take his animal, make his animal sit down. He would pray and the animal would be a sutra. So the point here is, ikhwani, some of the scholars say you don't have to have a sutra. But that's not our religion. That's not the delil. Concerning the issue of the sutra from the importance of it is, it has a reason, sabab shar'i, has a religious reason that will stop a person's prayer from becoming batila. He has to repeat his prayer. If three things happen, if a person's praying without a sutra, if he's praying with a sutra, a woman tries to come in front of him while he's praying. If she makes it in front of him, he has to start that prayer over again. A woman who was on her menses, akramakumullah. If the donkey goes between him and his sutra, it breaks his salat, has to start all over again. If a black dog goes between him and his sutra, he has to start his prayer all over again. Those three, three things, they prevent the sutra, they prevent the prayer, prevent the prayer. So the fact that the sutra establish a place that becomes his domain while he's praying. No one should go in front of him. He has the right in al-Islam to stop the person. And if he doesn't stop one of those three issues, then his salat is rendered batila. Let us take a look at the companions of the Prophet concerning this issue. Radiallahu anhum wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar 
He prayed with the people. He was leaving the masjid. He saw a man was praying without a sutra. Umar radiallahu anhu sat in front of the man, faced the qibla. The man finished his prayer. Umar turned around and told the man, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idha salla ahadukum fal yastatir. If one of you prays and take a sutra. Umar is the khalif, he's busy. He had many things to do. He wanted to more than educate the man. He wanted to show him this is something you have to do. Number two, number two, Umar. Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. There is a man from the Tabi'een, his name is Qurb Yas. He said, I was praying between two pillars, and I was praying without a sutra. Umar radiallahu anhu came by while I was praying. He grabbed me by my neck, the nape of my neck, right here. And he pulled me over, and he put me behind the sutra while I was praying. And then he told me, radiallahu anhu, sallu ilay, salli ilayha, pray towards this thing, pray towards the sutra. While the man was in the prayer. And we had that a lot with the companions. We had them taking braids out of people's hair while they're praying in sajda. We had them pulling people and moving people in order to do something that the Prophet commanded with. And they would never do that knowing the importance and the hurma of the salat. There's a hadith that he said about the salat. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna fi salat la shughla. The prayer is something that makes you busy. What rakah are you on? Reciting with concentration, doing all of the mechanics. No prayer has room for someone to come to disturb them with turning up the volume of the TV. In the masjid, the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La yaqra ba'dukum ala ba'd. While you're in the masjid, someone's praying, and you're sitting there reading the Quran, he said, Don't read that Quran loud to disturb that man. It's a hurma, a hurma. And Muslims have always held on to this. Even now Muslims have it. When they want to execute someone, they say, you have any last witches along with your last meal? You want to make your last prayer? And they leave them to make that last prayer. That happened with the companions and that continues to happen. They asked one of the companions, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, they were going to kill him. They say, you want to pray before we kill you? He say, yes. He made a good little book. He prayed to Rakat. After the Turaqat, he told those people, if it wasn't for the fact that I was afraid that you people would have thought I was going to prolong my prayer because I was afraid, I'd have prolonged my prayer. I only made it short because I wanted to make the Turaqat and I didn't want you to think I was scared if you were scared of death. So the non-Muslims, they order, they allow a person, hey, we're going to pay attention. This is your last prayer. Go ahead, take it easy. You're going to pray? They don't disturb you. So those companions would not dare interrupt people Unless it was something serious while they were praying. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, min al jifa. Four things are from what is dry. What is dry here, jifa means unacceptable. The way you deal with your brother, your jaff. You're tough and rough with him. He said, four things are from this. He mentions, sallallahu radiallahu anhu. And you salli al-rajal ila ghayri sutratan. For a man to pray without a sutra is from jifa in his prayer. The second one he mentioned that was from the prayer is for a man to hear the adhan and then he doesn't go and he doesn't answer the adhan. That's Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Anas ibn Malik and what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari. He said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَصْحَابَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَبْتَدِرُونَ بَيْنَ يَبْتَدِرُونَ السَّوَارِ عِنْدَ الْمَغْرَبِ حَتَّى يَخْرُجُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. If the adhan went off for Salat al-Maghrib, I used to see that the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, they would hurry to go behind the pillars in order to pray to rakats until the Prophet came out صلى الله عليه وسلم. So that shows a few things. It goes to show it is from the sunnah and it is permissible for a person to pray to rakats after the adhan of al-Maghrib. For this reason, another hadith. Baina kulli adhanayn salat. Between the adhan and every iqama. Every adhan and there is a prayer. to raka. If you want to, any prayer of the five prayers. If there's an adhan and an iqama, you can pray two rakas at that time. Because again, some of the madhahib, they say, you can't pray two rakat after maghrib. 
So the adhan goes off, and right away, they make the iqamah. And if you begin to pray, they're making kar. What are you doing? That's not from the sunnah. That's from the sunnah. Sayyid al-Bukhari, between every adhan and iqamah is salat, and also this issue of Anas ibn Umari. And look at the short time, ikhwani, between the adhan and the iqamah. It's not a long time. And yet, he said, I saw the companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them. After the adhan of al-Maghrib, they will go and they will find their places behind the pillars and they will pray there to rakat. Nafi' Nafi' was the free slave of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. The greatest chain of narration in hadith is the chain of narration that consists of Al-Imam Malik took the hadith from Nafi' the free slave of Ibn Umar. And he heard the hadith from Ibn Umar that the Prophet ﷺ said whatever the hadith is. The scholars said that this is the golden chain. And Imam al-Bukhari was with the opinion this is the strongest chain of narration. Other scholars had other opinions. Nafi' He said Abdullah Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu wanted to pray. He didn't find the sutra so he said to Nafi, you sit down and you be my sutra. In another narration, Nafi said, Abdullah ibn Umar would never pray except that he prayed towards a sutra. Again, the companion of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa who we mentioned earlier, Salama ibn al-Aqwa, the one who the Prophet gave him a lot of sadaqah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come into Islam. And what was collected by the Imam ibn Abi Sheba with an authentic chain of narration. He was in the desert. And when he was in the desert, when it was time to pray, he would get rocks and he would pile those rocks on top of each other and he would use those rocks as a sutra. So for the people who take the opinion, you don't have to have a sutra in the desert. You don't have to have the sutra if you're outside. You don't have, there's no delil for that. The Prophet sallallahu and his companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, they used to pay attention to this issue. Next one, praying in the graveyard or on graves, as it is common in many of the masajid in the Muslim world, Pakistan, and in other than Pakistan. This is from the Kaba'ir. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Jinn, in the masajid lillahi fala tad'u ma'allahi ahada. The masjids, they only belong to Allah, so don't call on anyone along with Allah inside of the masjid or outside of the masjid. One of the last hadith that came out of the mouth of our Nabi and our Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is what one of his wives told him while he was lying there dying and he was sick. She said, Ya Rasulullah, when we made hijra to Ethiopia, we saw in the churches over there that they had buried their prophets in their masjids. They drew pictures about people and hung them up in their churches, in their synagogues. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Qatul Allah al Yahuda wa Nasara, Ittahadu Kabura and Biaihim, Masajid. May Allah destroy the Yahud and the Nasara because they took the graves of their prophets as masjids. He said in another authentic hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, Inna min sharari nats, men, from the worst people are those people who Yom al Qiyamah is established while they are living. And from the worst people are the people who take masjids or graves as masjids. He told the people in prohibiting us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tajrisu ala al qabur wa la tusallu ilayha. Don't sit on a grave and don't pray towards a grave. He told us from our sunnah, his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, اجعلوا من صلاتكم في بيوتكم ولا تتخذوها قبورا. He told the Muslim men, give your houses, give your homes a portion of your prayer. Pray in your homes, meaning the sunnah prayers, the nawafir. اجعلوا Make your prayer, some of your prayers. Give some of your prayers to your houses. He said, and don't make your homes like graves. It's the meaning of the hadith. 
You can't pray at the grave. So don't make your house like the graves. Don't make your home a place where you don't pray. Like the graves. So it's not permissible for the individual to go to a graveyard or anywhere where there is a grave and he prays in that place. The prayer of Qiyam and Rukur and Sajda. As for the Salat of Al-Janazah, then that's permissible. The Prophet prayed over people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who had died and they were buried, and he prayed over them while they were buried, but they prayed the Salat of Al-Janazah. And although it's Salat, there's no bending, there's no bowing, there's no prostrating. The greatest position of servitude to Allah is Wajal, something that's not permissible. As it relates to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being in Al-Medina, being in Al-Medina, this is why they put the wall around there because that grave should never have been included inside of the masjid. But when you weigh the situation, the benefits and the harms, they left it the way it was. When the Khalif of the Muslims did that, he did a big mistake. But it happened way after the companions. That wasn't something that happened during the time of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we say... We have to follow the salaf al-salih. We follow the righteous predecessors. We follow what the predecessors did that was correct. Even if they were religious and righteous, but they did something that was incorrect, we don't follow them in that. We don't follow a companion, one companion, in every issue that he brought because one companion, he made a mistake in this, he made a mistake in that, he made a mistake in the other thing. May Allah be pleased with him. So the people who insist on praying and messages with graves in it. They use that as a dilil. That's not a dilil. Prophet Muhammad told you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told I, don't pray in the place where there is a grave. If for some reason a person has property, his grandfather, granddad, someone was buried on that property, no problem. You can pray upstairs, you can pray in wherever, but don't pray in the room or in that area where that dead person has been buried. Last thing that we want to mention, Ikhwani, from the people of Khurafat, is the people who pray and they take stones out. And they claim that these stones are from the stones of Karbala in Al Iraq. And they come up with a lot of hadith that don't even have any chain of narration for you to even say that it's not authentic. So when it's time for them to pray, they take out of their pockets stones and they throw them on the floor. And they make sajda on this. And they say that this is what they call a turbatul Husseiniya, the dirt of Hussein. The Prophet he saw, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told his companions, I saw the blood of my grandson Hussein being spilt in the dirt of Al Iraq. He told them that. That's authentic. So these people with their ghulu, the people of a tashayyur, with their ghulu from Iran and Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, from Syria and other than that. They believe if you pray and you put your head on this, on this soil, it's better than Mecca and Medina, Beitul Maqdis. Your prayer goes up if you pray with your head on that piece of rock, Khurafat. And then they go and they lie. I told you there is a hadith that the Prophet Wasallam said, he saw the blood of his grandson spilling on the earth in Al Iraq. He saw that. So Hussein, he knew that hadith. And the companions used to come to him and tell him, Don't go. The Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're going to be killed in that place. And there was drama. He knows it's a, it's a tough situation. There was a lot of fitna. That's the last place in the world you should go. Don't go. Abdullah ibn Abbas was telling him, don't go, this is relative, don't go. And Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al abbas wrote a book about the bravery of Hussein, radiallahu anhu, that he knew about these ahadith, and yet he still went because he was telling the people, the qadr and the qada is not going to miss you. And I have to do what I'm doing because he was convinced about what he was doing. And when he went, sure enough, the people who were supposed to be his ansar, they tricked him and betrayed him, and he was killed. This is authentic that the Prophet saw that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's in the book or the hadith, Imam al-Suyuti, Imam al-Haythami. Different people brought this hadith. 
So what do the people of Al-Iraq and these people, they bring these hadith, they say even the people of the Sunnah, the other these people of the Sunnah, they believe in this because Suyuti brought this and this one brought that. No, they brought the story about what happened with Hussein. They brought the story about what the Prophet prophesied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They never brought a delil or a hadith that you're trying to prove that you prostrate on the dirt of Karbala. This is something that is impermissible and it's not from the deen of Allah. This is what we wanted to deal with, Ikhwani, from the many issues concerning the mistakes of the Amakin that we have to be aware of. Those of you who are working, pay attention in your house, pay attention about these issues. If you have any questions, you can put your questions forward, inshallah. What time your bus comes today? No time. Further. One of the places that you cannot pray authentic hadith is that the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tu sallu fi marabit al ibil. Don't pray in the corral of the camel. The place where the camels are being locked in, don't pray in that area. One of the reasons is because when they asked him, Why, Ya Rasulullah, he said, Ma'ahum shaitan. The camels have a shaitan with them. For no reason, for no reason, that camel will come and attack you. Even if he sees you way over there, maybe he's your friend for a long time. I don't know that you guys see that what's up thing where the two men were behind the tree messing with the camel and the camel grabbed the guy by the head and slung him over. Those camels, you can't mess with the camel. The camel can be your friend for a long time. Comes up to you and he rubs you for a long time, 10, 15 years. And then just like that, he'll kick your head off because he has his shape on and that's why if you eat his meat, he breaks your wudu. With him is a shaitan. So don't pray in the corral of the camel and don't pray in the maqbara where the uh, graveyard is and don't pray in a place where there's najasa in that place. Where you're going to be praying, there is najasa in that particular place. Any more questions? If these are two different issues, don't get that mixed up. There is a hadith of the Prophet from his sunnah what he encouraged us to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, amal ma duima alayhi wa inqalla. The best deed that you can do is what you do consistently, even if it's a little bit. You do one raka'ah of al witr all the time. It's better than doing witr only in Ramadan. 11 raka'ah and so forth and so on. But then you leave it after that. So even if it's a little bit. So what about the fact that here this hadith is saying, do the thing regularly, constantly. Doing something constantly is one thing, but doing that thing constantly in the same place is another thing. So in our religion, this is one of the issues that we have with the brothers from Jamaat al-Tabliq and the many innovations that they've introduced in the religion that they hold on to and it's a part of their religion. When they're going to go out for their jola or their khuruj, the people are going to make khuruj, they go to the door of the masjid and they make dua at that door. They don't make dua here. They don't make dua at the mimbar. They don't make dua here or there. It has to be at the door. Why do you do that all the time? If you do something in the same place all the time, the same number all the time, the same mode, candles, incense, all the time, you have to have delil for that. So, Doing something consistently is one thing, but doing it consistently in a particular place, number or mode, is a different issue altogether. Somebody over it. Fuddi, yeah. Concerning the Masjid al Haram, where there is Zahma. In those issues, women walk in front of you in that particular place. Sometimes it's difficult to get a sutra even leave the woman, but in that particular place it's hard because of the zahma. So someone went to Arabia, I forgot who it was, he brought me a book back before where 
one of the sheikhs wrote a book about the ahkam of a zahma in Mecca. Different ahkam that you have to deal with because there are so many people. What is the ruling when you're trying to get from Muzdalifa to go to Mina? And because of the zahma, maybe the rule changes. And like this brother just mentioned. So what happens if a person is praying and a woman comes between him and his sutra? He doesn't know if she has a period or not. Akramakumullah. He doesn't know. So he keeps praying. Especially if it was, she was being forced to do it. She didn't mean it. People were pushing. And it just happened. Mistake. When our mother Aisha heard this authentic hadith, she became angry. She said to the men, what is wrong with you people equating us women with dogs and with donkeys? She said, wallahi, the prophet used to pray in my house, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and I would be lying down and my legs would be stretched out. And when he wanted to make sajda, he would touch my legs and I would pull my legs in. And then he would make sajda and get up and then I would put my legs out. Which goes to show touching a woman doesn't break your wudu, doesn't break your fast. And it also goes to show, I'm in front of him. I was his sutra. So she became angry. That Imam, Al Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, here Aisha is saying what she's saying, and it's true. So Al Bukhari a Muslim. Over here, the Prophet said, the woman breaks your wudu, breaks your salah. In that book, Mushkil al Athar, explaining the things that are problematic, he brought the narrations where it added on and said, if the woman has her menses, not just any woman, if she has her menses. Now, clearly, no one here is going to be in Mecca, and a woman goes by and he's going to say, hey, 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 dude, he's not going to do that. There's no edip. He's just going to say, I'm just going to think that way because I can't even ask that question. So he just leaves it alone. He just leaves it alone. Ikhwani, some Muslims with feeble minds or Muslims who don't understand some of the enemies of Al-Islam from the disbelievers, when they hear hadith like this, they understand that these hadith are bringing women down. And that's because when a person is not a Muslim and he doesn't totally submit to Allah, he is mutamarrid. He's a renegade. You know, like in America, in the West, Jesse James and those people, they're renegades. They rob the train, they rob the bank, and then they go in the West and they're out in the West, renegades. That's how Benny Adam becomes when he gets away from the religion that Allah revealed upon the people and legislated for the people. Don't be a renegade. There's a problem with that woman as it relates to her, her period, Akramakumullah. Allah created them like that. And he knows why he created them like that. So the one with Islam, he doesn't bother him. It's easy for him. Another issue, Ikhwani, before I take this last question from my man, Afdal, about praying inside of the church. Some of these brothers who would have killed Salama ibn al-Aqwa, chopped his head off when he was a non-Muslim, you know this mentality, this rough, tough, they make takfir of some of the Muslims who go inside of churches for da'wah in Allah. And they say that this is kufr because you can't do this. It's from the tawarit and so forth and so on. We say to these people, hey, first of all, don't think that you people are the only ones who understand that it is imperative for the Muslim to disbelieve in the tawarit. That's our religion. You are not a real Muslim if you don't believe, if you don't reject the tawarit. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالْتَاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ Anyone who rejects Taghut and he believes in Allah, he has grabbed the handhold that never breaks. Alam tara ila ladina yaz'umuna annahum amanu bima unzila ilayk wa ma unzila min qabal yuriduna an yatahakamu wa lat taghut wa yuridu shay wa qad wa وَقَدْ أُمِرُوا أَنْ يَكْفِرُوا بِي وَيُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ وَإِنْ يَضُلُّهُمْ ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدًا Do you not see, Ya Muhammad, those people who say and claim they believe in what was revealed to you, they believe in what was revealed after you, and they want to make judgment to the taghut? They were commanded to disbelieve in the taghut. But shaitan wants to send them astray. 
So we have to disbelieve in the Ta'ut. But the Ta'ut that we disbelieve, Ikhwani, is not the Ta'ut that these brothers make it a meaning that's dayat, very restricted. Ta'ut is the hukam of the Muslims. That's only Ta'ut. No. And Imam Malik said that the Ta'ut is everything that is worshipped along with Allah. Everything that is worshipped along with Allah. Now remember when I first started giving da'wah, when I read that, when I found that out, I made a mistake that still is in my mind. I clarified it many times, but it's still in my mind. And it was because at that time I was brand new. Based upon what Imam Malik said, I said, Isa ibn Maryam is a ta'ghut because Imam Malik said, everything that is worshipped along with Allah, anything that is worshipped is ta'ghut. No, the scholars, they said, but if the individual is not called into that worship, he's not pleased with that worship. Isa ibn Maryam wasn't pleased with that. The sun and the moon is not pleased with that. Some of the awliya of Allah from the NBA, not pleased with that. So we understand we have to disbelieve in the ta'ghut. But to make takfir of Muslims for going to give da'wah, why would Umar go into the church? Why would Umar, why would Abdullah ibn Abbas, why would they go into the church? Because they had nowhere else to play, to give da'wah to the people, to educate those people and so forth and so on. So if you're going to make takfir of people, then what are you going to do with those companions Radiallahu anhu. Last question. Our brother Afdal. Our man, our companion, Afdal. And we also want to welcome back our brother Abu Isa. Alhamdulillah, Allah brought Abu Isa. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Last question, inshallah, in the, in the coming days, um, we're going to do something about the sutra because this is something that uh, is pretty important. Concerning the sutra, if a person is praying and then after he prays, he came late, for an example, and there is someone who is in front of him, gets up and leaves, and now he doesn't have a sutra. I'm of the opinion that if it's a fard prayer, he doesn't have to move. He doesn't have to move because we don't have the companions doing this. And this is something that Ahmad Bil Balwa, something that happened during their time. So if that was the thing to do, they would have done it. But if you're standing in a place where you're in the walkway, or like right there, you're in the walkway, standing there is going to make things difficult. So once the lot is over, then you can move over to get out of the way so people can pass by. So if it's the far prayer, just stay in your position, as Allah commanded. Fattakullah mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. Just do your thing. But some of the scholars say you can move. And Imam Malik, and Al Bani, some people said that you can move. Uh, but I never saw any delil for that. And Allah is A'la in A'la. Okay, Ikhwani, we're going to stop here, inshallah. Tomorrow we're going to deal with the preparation of fasting in the month of Ramadan. Hada. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Vice, he has an empty hand for the test.